Welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Massey and I'm the Senior Science and Policy Advisor with CHE, the Collaborative for Health and Environment. We invite you to drop a note in the chat introducing yourself and where you're zooming in from if you'd like to. I'm just going to start with a few bits of housekeeping before handing things over to today's moderator. CHE is a member group of the EDC Strategies Partnership, which is bringing you today's webinar. Partnership members include Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies, or HEADS, the Biomonitoring Resource Center, and the Health and Environment Alliance, or HEAL. CHE also hosts science discussion listservs and supports other collaborative programs focused on promoting environmental health and justice. For those of you who are calling in on the phone, we've posted slides to accompany the webinar on our website. You can download the slides by going to today's webinar page. You'll find the link in the upcoming webinar section of our homepage at healthandenvironment.org. You'll click on slides and resources, that section of the webinar page. We'll drop the web, web page link in the chat for those who are online. We will disable the chat once we get started so everyone can focus on the presentation, but please do type any questions you have for the speaker in the Q&A box at any point, and we'll get to as many comments and questions as we can after the presentation. We're scheduled to go for 30 minutes, although we may go a bit over depending on the Q&A. This webinar is being recorded for our archive. With that, I'll hand it over to today's moderator, Janan Jensen, Founder and Executive Director of Health and Environment Alliance, HEAL. Janan? Thank you very much, Rachel, for the introduction. It's great to be here today and welcome everybody. Air pollution is the top environmental threat to people's health worldwide. Recent science has underlined the health threat from polluted air, even at very low concentrations, and that there is most likely no safe level of pollution. Studies have also shown that the range of health impacts is much larger than previously thought, with air pollution now considered a risk factor for all chronic disease. In the past years, our understanding of how children's healthy development is impacted by poor air quality even before birth has also considerably increased. So I'm very excited that this webinar will be the focus uh, today with our distinguished speaker, Professor Paul A. Fowler from the Institute of Medical Sciences at the University of Aberdeen. Professor Fowler is a zoologist who studied the endocrine regulation of reproduction and development for, much, for most of his career. His work focuses on the effects of environmental lifestyle exposures, such as maternal smoking, obesity, medication use, and chemicals, including endocrine disrupting compounds on human fetal development. Since 2009, he has led or participated in several major EU research programs studying endocrine disruption, including REEF, Protected, Freya, Initialize, and the new EU human biomonitoring project called PARC. It's a real pleasure to welcome Professor Fowler today, who will speak to us about his findings on maternal exposure to air pollution, nanoparticles, and adverse birth outcomes. So welcome, Professor Fowler, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'll start off just by saying I have no interest to declare in this area, and um, thank my collaborators, um, who you can see in the papers, and also the funders who are so important to enabling us to do this work. Now, for a long time, my group has focused on this issue around how the first nine months of your life sets the trend for many of your health and function and well-being characteristics after birth. Now, let's turn to air pollution. So air pollution really is defined as when you have an excess of uh, chemicals or other substances that become high enough to start endangering health, uh, well-being, um, both of humans and animals. And um, even noise can be counted amongst um, pollution. So the kind of chemicals we get in air pollution include things like uh, ozone, sulfur and nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. And particulate matter is increasingly of attention in this field. And um, particulate matter is a mixture of uh, liquid and solid droplets in the air. They're suspended, they travel everywhere. Um, and they contain a whole range of other compounds uh, like acids, um, nitrates, 
uh, soot, metals, soil, dust, small spiders, biological materials, and endocrine disrupting compounds. They, of course, also contain plastics and um, black carbon, black carbon being, like many of these pollutants, a product of incomplete combustion, for instance, of engines, of industrial processes, and so, so on. And these micro and nanoparticles um, increasingly seem to be um, offering a threat to us and um, our world. There, as um, Genon said, there are multiple adverse consequences of being exposed as a child or adult to air pollution, and these range uh, right across the, the field, including respiratory, pulmonary, and immune function deficits, amongst others. Now, there are many reasons why we should be interested in controlling air pollution. So this paper came out, um, well, this month. And it focused on the city of Barcelona, which is a, a fairly large city in Spain. Many of you have probably visited. And if they achieved the current World Health um, interim air quality targets just for PM 2.5, so the very smallest particulate matter, and uh, nitrogen dioxide, they could avoid over 400 deaths and save nearly 300 million euros annually. You think about that multiplied across the planet. So when we look back in time to where a lot of this started in the UK, there were what there were things that were called pea supers. So these were these dense, uh, very unhealthy smogs that struck big cities like London. And in 1952, December 52, for five days, there was the Great Smog of London. And that five days of smog was um, associated with 12,000 excess deaths. So this event and many others around the world led to a wave of air quality control, regulation and enforcement that cleaned up our act quite a lot. But where are we today? So if you take what is viewed by many as modern pollution, and modern pollution covers chemical pollution, which could be all sorts of things, industrial components, um, pesticides, all sorts of stuff out there, even in some ways um, uh, medication, and air pollution, put those together, they are responsible for at least 9 million deaths globally each year. And the levels of what are um, broadly called this modern pollution have more than gone up by more than 50% in the last 20 years. We've reached the point where the World Health Organization reckons that nine out of 10 of us are breathing polluted air. Now, you might be asking, if I'm interested in the first nine months of life, why am I interested in air pollution? Well, here's one of the reasons. If you were in the womb for those five days during the great smog in London, you had an 8% increased risk of childhood asthma five days and that in such that's a massive increase for just five days exposure so one of the questions of course you ask and it's really difficult to answer is how do these environmental conditions affect human development in the womb and i want to just talk a bit about some of the issues and um, things we should think about in this area so first of all normal development in our own species remains surprisingly badly understood uh, and well there are clear ethical reasons for that um, and the other thing is it's complicated and this applies to all mammals of course that there's three-way exchange between mother placenta and fetus and back again so if the mother takes on um, air pollution for instance breathes it in some of that will be passed to the placenta and then to the fetus. How much the placenta protects the fetus is a moot point and very variable. Some of it, of course, the mother will process and excrete. Some will be passed back to the mother and then excreted. However, some compounds may actually be trapped in the fetal compartment. So an example here would be bisphenol A, which if it crosses the placenta, the fetus has the equipment, the machinery in its liver to glucuronidate bisphenol A, which stops it just automatically traveling back across the placenta. It has to be actively transported. In addition, these compounds can be urinated by the fetus into the amniotic fluid. It then drinks the amni amniotic fluid and you have these compounds going round and round and round in the fetus. 
Um, the placenta itself, and of course the fetus changes across the trimesters, and the placenta is different from the first trimester to the term pl uh, placenta. And then there are sex differences in terms of how uh, sensitive a fetus will be to particular exposures and also how it develops. And some of these differences, of course, are retained even in adulthood. So the practical problems are include ethical constraints, um, which I certainly do not argue with. And also, if you're sampling, you can sample easily from the mother at term, well, the mother across pregnancy. You can sample the placenta at term. You can sample the neonate at term. But if you want to understand what's happening in the first, second, and third trimesters, that is difficult. Then there's the issue, if you study the fetus, how do you link these prenatal to postnatal studies? I mean, remember, it takes decades to, to travel from adult to baby to new adult. So it's very difficult. There are numerous confounding factors um, involved. And also, when you're studying the human fetus, how do you acquire sufficient statistical power and reproducibility to have reliable data? And this is these are the kinds of challenges we've been um, dealing with for a long time. So the fetuses are um, we have several fetal collections. We currently collect uh, seven to 20 weeks of gestation, a whole range of fetal organs and maternal data. Um, these are from elective terminations by uh, non-surgical means of normal pregnancies. And we can look at all sorts of things, smoking, deprivation, obesity, use of medication, drinking. Um, and in 1949, a data bank was set up to follow all the pregnancies in Aberdeen called the Aberdeen Maternity and Neonatal Data Bank. And this is on the same population as our fetuses. So we can also do epidemiology on that population. And uh, recently we published a paper, for instance, using 151,000 pregnancies to look at uh, the increased risk of adverse outcomes if the mother took analgesics. So where does that take us now? Well, these are the kinds of studies we publish. And I'll draw your attention to those that involve maternal smoking. Now, cigarette smoke has well over 9,000 odd chemicals in it, many of which are found in air pollution. And both air pollution and cigarette smoke also contain endocrine disrupting compounds such as polycy polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And we also, of course, study um, normal development. So air pollution and pregnancy outcomes. Well, I'm not going to talk you through a whole range of studies, but this is an important one that came out in January this year. What they did was to take 81 eligible cohorts, and they excluded some, and uh, do a meta-analysis to determine what, if you took those studies together, what they reliably showed. And here are three, three of the main findings. Preterm birth, which we know is bad for your future um, health and function, small for gestational age, the same, and of course, um, uh, tragic for the parents is stillbirth. And when we look at all of these, they increase uh, for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air that the mother is exposed to. And if we look at PM 2.5s against stillbirth, you can see there's a 26% increased risk of stillbirth if you're exposed to this small particular air pollution. And of course, that is by no means all, because you have a very similar list to adult exposure, heart disease, diabetes, uh, pulmonary disease, allergies, um, autism spectrum risks, particularly in boys, and even some emerging data on maternal thyroid function. Maternal thyroid function is important for fetal development, including brain development and air pollution is variously associated with signs of reduced cognitive function. And there are also more functional changes such as fetal and uh, neonatal DNA repair capacity. Now, this uh, PM 2.5 effect of increasing stillbirth really caught our eye because when we studied our, our population, we found that if a woman had been um, inside a smoking mother, so if her mother smoked during pregnancy, the woman herself then was more likely to have a miscarriage. 
So that made us very interested, and we increasingly wondered about placental protection. And in 2019, Tim Nawat, who I, I happen to know, uh, published this paper showing that black carbon air pollution particles reached the fetal compartment of the placenta. So I was on the phone to Tim really quickly, and then COVID happened. So we didn't publish the study that we got together until 2022. And here it is, you can see on screen. And we combined our two cohorts. So Tim's cohort is the EnviroNage cohort. He contributed 60 mother-child pairs. Um, he had uh, uh, residential black carbon pollution data for these mothers uh, using a validated method. And this is in the city of Genk in Belgium. We contributed the SAFER study and 36 fetuses with an average age of 14 weeks of gestation. And from each fetus, we contributed tissue sections from placenta, liver, lung, brain, uh, from the same fetuses. And these were from Aberdeen in Scotland. And both of us contributed only material from non-smoking mothers. So how was this done? Well, in both tissue and blood, we counted black uh, carbon particles, and it was a postdoc called Eva Bongertz who did this work. Um, very dedicated and hard worker. So the, the, she counted these particles. And uh, you can see here in this tissue section, uh, some particles highlighted with these white arrows. And it's important to discriminate between the particles and other features in the tissue. Um, a lot of work went into making this um, uh, reliable. So working your way from left to right in this graph, you've got uh, uh, cord blood, maternal blood, and term placenta, and you can see the range of numbers of particles are quite similar. The scale is different between the blood and the placenta, so just be wary of that. Um, and as you, you would think, it looks like the placenta has fewer. There's also calibration to calibrate uh, numbers of particles uh, counted against the numbers that are spiked into uh, test compounds to make sure that we are counting the right number. Then, of course, when you're counting in tissues, you want to make sure that you only count black carbon particles inside the tissue itself. OK, so that also takes careful and meticulous work. So Scotland's air quality is really good uh, in European terms. We know what the PM 2.5 levels are for Aberdeen as a whole, and you can see the range there. But unfortunately, we do not have black carbon data for Aberdeen. In Belgium, on the other hand, uh, the residential exposure data covered their entire pregnancies, and you can see the black carbon uh, levels here, up to 2.34 micrograms per cubic meter of air. So what did we find? So first of all, here is a um, number of particles on the um, left and concentration of particles in the air on the bottom axis. You can see here that over those concentrations, maternal blood tends to have higher levels of black carbon particles than cord blood. So essentially, you could think of that as fetal blood, or rather term blood in this case. And that's not surprising. And then if we look at the placenta, we see the same kind of uh, relationship. And in fact, they are very similar. So the rate at which the number of particles increase with increasing exposure uh, is very slim, similar between these three sets of tissues. Now, when we look in the fetus, the first thing I want to draw your attention to um, is that not surprisingly, the placenta in the, for these fetuses has higher levels of, of uh, black carbon particles. But you can see here, that uh, the other tissue is not far behind and rather worryingly is that the brain is uh, not being protected by the developing blood brain barrier. Now there's quite a lot of thought to unpack what might be going on and this is one of those areas where we know very little about the mechanisms of action of black carbon and in fact a lot of other um, particulate matter. In general, they are 
genotoxic, and this can be associated with increased mutations and uh, cancer and so on. And also there are issues about changing to changes to how the cell looks, how it functions, how its organelles work, um, whether how good it is at staying alive, and also um, its metabolic rate. And these can also be associated with things like cancer, endocrine effects, and developmental effects. And bear in mind, when we look at the particle sizes in the fetal organs, these include the 2.5 range and also between 2.5 and 10 in terms of um, um, their size. This is quite approximate. The technique is not good at very accurately measuring particle size, but the take-home message is there that they can work right down into the two PM 2.5 range. So following on from this, does it matter whether the nanoparticles are close or whether they're carrying other things? TI stands for titanium and PAH is short for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And these are also endocrine disruptors. So nanoparticles are brilliant for sticking compounds. And in fact, they're being looked at um, as ways of delivering drugs into the body, into cells. Um, having looked at my data, I'm not too happy about the thought of them being used to deliver drugs to pregnant women. So this is the idea of the Trojan horse. But does it matter if they, they're delivered near the particles or actually, uh, sorry, near the cells or actually into the cells? And does it matter whether they go into the nucleus or not? So you can see there's a lot here we need to unpack. I've had a couple of ideas. We've got a grant application submitted to try and drill deeper into this. Um, but, you know, what are the effects? Do they differ and how do they differ? And, of course, a reminder that things like um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons affect the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, AHR, in many organs and then have endocrine disruptive effects. So to conclude, there is substantial evidence for multiple adverse outcomes for pregnancy and for the developing fetus. Um, air pollution is associated with many um, health deficits and pregnancy deficits right up to and including uh, pregnancy loss, so stillbirth, that's where the fetus dies. And PM 2.5 are especially associated with this, but not uniquely PM 10s. The bigger particles are also associated with these effects. Our study shows that uh, black carbon particles um, increase in maternal tissues and neonatal tissues in the placenta proportionally to how much pollution the mother is exposed to. And every fetus and every organ of that fetus that we have studied contains these black carbon particles. The placenta and the, the brain, the blood brain barrier are not totally protecting the fetus by any means. And as a result of this publication, a month later, uh, this opinion piece appeared in the BMJ, and it cited our study as one of the important supporting pieces of evidence that we really must fight to ensure children have good air quality. And shortly afterwards, we found ourselves um, involved in uh, this post system in the UK Parliament on outdoor air quality. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you again for the invitation to speak today. Thank you very much, Professor Fowler, for this excellent presentation and really underlining uh, again why we need to act to prevent harm for um, health harm to children. Particularly interesting to see uh, that it was taken to the uh, UK to Parliament. Um, very interesting. I have um, a couple of, of one question to start off, and then I would also ask people to put your questions in the Q&A. You listed a whole range of increased risks for adverse offspring. Uh, offspring consequences, such as heart disease, diabetes, allergies, even changes to DNA. Can you say something more about how these risks can manifest themse themselves later in life? And is there any evidence of intergenerational harm like we have for certain chemicals? In, in terms of air pollution, um, I mean, inter intergenerational is one of the scariest, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. 
then um, there is some evidence from smoking, for instance, uh, those small studies where the grandmother smoking during pregnancy um, could have effects, for instance, on um, the granddaughter. Um, in terms of air pollution, I'm not clear how solid the tra any trans or intergenerational effects are. What you have to remember, of course, is that the either the precursors for the germ cells or the actual germ cells, in the case of the ovary, are present in the fetus, in the fetus's ovary, when the fetus is inside the mother. So that granddaughter could be directly affected if it then affects the great grandchild that is truly intergenerational in terms of the, the the adverse health effects i mean some of these are being seen in childhood and some are, are increased risk in adulthood and um, some can be progressive so if you're exposed as a fetus and then as a child and then as an adult to the same adverse um adverse um, effects, then you could have an increased risk of, of that being more serious um, later in life. Because remember, a risk doesn't mean you are going to have that adverse outcome. It means how likely you are to have it. And if we take the case of the risk of stillbirth, yes, the risk of stillbirth isn't all that high, but if you increase that 26%, mm -hmm. Plus, you might have other things. If the mother's overweight and she's she's also eating um, food full of uh, pesticides and other compounds and so on, then you can see the multiplier effect of these of endocrine disruption, particulate matter, and all sorts of things coming together. So each one by itself presents a, a risk, but combined, then you move to a greater chance, perhaps, that that risk will become an actual adverse outcome. Thank you. I have questions rolling in now. So another one uh, is, in your study, did you look at the disproportionate effects that mothers who are living in disadvantaged lower, oh, I just missed the lower income communities may or may not have face concerning air pollution and its effect on the fetus? That, that is something we'd like to do. In this study, we um, didn't particularly select for that. We were looking for um, um, uh, non-smokers and to do this study with 36 fetuses, 36 pregnancies, to then be certain of an effect of deprivation against non-deprivation. The numbers are not big enough, frankly for that. Uh, we do, what I can say is that we see no effect of deprivation on the likelihood of the mother consenting to the study, except for those in the very lowest social categories who um, um, present a different picture. Thank you. Another question on uh, asking for to elaborate a bit on the relationship between air pollution, thyroid problems, and reduced cognitive skills. So uh, measuring cognitive skills is is um, quite complex, and I don't claim to be an expert on that, but I do understand that it's complex. So the studies that are out there now associating with air pollution are quite variable, as you'd expect. Um, the overall suggestion, though, looks like cognitive effects of um, air pollution. And when you add that to some emerging data, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing whether that is reinforced, that uh, maternal thyroid function um, can be affected by air pollution, then you may have a double hit on the developing fetus because uh, while the fetal thyroid gland starts to contribute to the fetus's own thyroid hormones, um, it, it's decreasingly reliant on the mother as pregnancy continues, but it is reliant, particularly in the first trimester, on maternal contribution of thyroid hormone. So if she herself is um, showing 
some decrease in thyroid production, then that could have uh, sort of double consequences. Thank you. Um, another question on, is there any evidence that less air pollution during COVID period resulted in fewer pregnancy problems? I think those studies uh, either have or are been ongoing, but I don't remember clearly enough to actually answer that question. I wouldn't <laughs> want to mislead the audience. It's a very good question, though, because, um, however, um, don't forget a lot of air pollution is indoors too. So all of you watching who are burning, uh, uh, even if it's an enclosed one, a wood fire, or if maybe your gas cooker is not really well serviced, uh, then you may be exposed to quite a lot of uh, air pollution indoors. And in fact, in, in third world countries where a lot of cooking is performed, um, for instance, on wood, uh, then one of the big things that can ameliorate uh, air quality for the, particularly for the mothers, of course, who spend more time cooking and their fetuses and children, is to provide a more modern, um, properly combusting sources of heat. Okay, thank you. I answered another question that was on wood burning. So you hit it without even being asked. <laughs> so uh, uh, thanking you for your crucial work. And then do we know that th if there is a linear relationship between the amount of black carbon in the air and poor health outcomes generally? Or does it seem like after a certain point, the damage is done and it doesn't matter? I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, when you look at it, um, of course, the studies are, all, are conducted frequently with variable levels between, depending on the country, the city, you know, where the study participants were recruited from. That's why they usually express in terms of an, an increase in a, in a set amount, like, you know, 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air increase in pollution is then associated with an increased risk. Um, from what I've seen of these studies and the, the way in which a lot of these findings seem to be, when you look at the meta-analyses, seem to be robustly supporting each other, I would expect there is a linear, a linear relationship, at which point that would then deviate. I don't know, um, but I'll probably go and have a dig <laughs> this uh, meeting. Thank you. I think I have time for one last question and um, I a question about whether you've looked into whether the particles enter the pancreas, if that was one area you studied. Uh... That's a good question. Um, I'd, I'd have to say, so we um, work with pediatric pathologist. So to help us make sure that we're um, accurately and well collecting tissues. And uh, the number of pancreas we've seen is quite small. And that's simply because the fetus is growing really fast over the range of our collection. And for a lot of time, some of these organs are really tiny. I had a colleague who wanted to do prostate study, and you could see why. And when I asked the pathologist uh, if he could help us, he just fell out of his chair laughing. You know, because you you mm -hmm. just can't dissect it out. Mm -hmm. It's too small. You have to use other methods. But okay. a good question Thank and yeah. interesting. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think we are at the end of our time. It went by very quickly. And I just want to thank you once again for uh, taking the time to share the study with us, to answer the questions and um, really uh, important work that you're doing. Um, because we know there's a lot of concrete opportunities, both in the US and the EU, um, as policymakers look at what uh, they're going to do to update, update their clean air standards. and. For us at HEAL and many health and medical groups, we're really calling for greater ambition with a full alignment of the EU's legally binding air standards to WHO's new recommendations and the latest science. So your studies and your work and others are really important uh, for policymakers. So thank you. And I'll hand back over to Rachel to close this up. 
Thank you so much, Shannon, and thank you very much, Professor Fowler, for a really excellent presentation on this important work. And thank you so much for all the thoughtful questions from today's participants. So just a few quick announcements as we wrap up today. First, a video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and everyone who registered for today's session will receive an email with a link to the video. Please keep an eye out for details on the next EDC Strategies Partnership call in February. You'll find details on the CHE website at thehealthandenvironment.org as soon as they're available. Also, in 2022, we marked CHE's 20th year with a series of informal conversations with leading researchers and innovators in the field of environmental health and justice. We called these CHE cafes, and we have another one coming up next month. Our next cafe will be a conversation with Dr. Linda Birnbaum and Dr. Ami Zota about the future of environmental health sciences. That will be on February 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. This discussion will be co-hosted with the new school at Commonweal. We hope you can join us. For those who are online, we'll put that link in the chat. Um, and note that this cafe was postponed from its original time. So if you've already registered, you don't need to RSVP again. We encourage you to support the work of any and all of the groups involved in the EDC Strategies Partnership. You'll find links to each group on Che's Partnerships page. If you appreciate these webinars, please consider a tax-deductible donation to Che and or any of these partners. With that, I'd like to again thank Professor Fowler so much for taking time to share this important research with us today, Shannon for her excellent moderation, Che Director Kristen Schaefer for behind the scenes support and all of you for joining us today. Thank you so much.